up, boys and girls? Welcome to another episode of Walk on Wisdom. It is April 24th as we are recording this episode. Uh, and a lot of times I don't like to say it in public, don't like to, the recognition, but today is my birthday. Uh, so I think that's why I'm extra motivated to put out a couple episodes because you can have everything you want in life if you will just help enough other people get what they want in life. That was a Zig Ziglar quote that my mentor and best friend, Chris Patterson, told me years ago when we met over a decade ago. And uh, my birthday, obviously, it's centered around me and my birth a few years ago, 37 to be exact. Um, I don't like to tell people I'm 37 years old because I just came into the UFC a couple of years ago. So people think I'm in my late twenties, early thirties, but your boy's 37 years old. But when you're running a podcast called Walk on Wisdom, um, that age, that wisdom is kind of important. Um, but as I said, I don't like to uh, acknowledge my birthday too much because I'd rather serve others than, you know, get all the the high fives and the hand claps for my birthday. But the best way I know how is to give you guys some, some value. So hope you guys get some value from this podcast. Uh, obviously if you were listening to this, you either found this on one of our social channels or heard it from a friend, you can send your questions into podcast at michaelchandler.com. Um, that's where myself and my team, we sift through them, put them, organize them, and put them in a nice little package for me to answer these questions and give you guys some insight into what you may be going through. Um, obviously, I can do Instagram lives all day long, but they always turn into kind of quick, small questions. I want your deeper questions, your longer questions, the ones that are really eating at your soul, really um, holding you back really when you're at a crossroads in your life, you can always make them anonymous if it's detailed or personal. And, um, I will answer them to the best of my abilities. As I always say, as a disclaimer, every single thing I say here, um, should not always be taken as the perfect advice. I am an expert at absolutely nothing, but I have been around the world a couple of times and, um, had a lot of ups, a lot of downs, been through a lot of things, struggled with a lot of things, still continue to struggle with things today. Uh, I don't think enough leaders out there admit their struggles, admit that they're struggling um, and ask for help. So I appreciate you guys sending in your questions to podcast at michaelchandler.com. Let's get right into it. The first question comes from Jessica. Hey, podcast team, I am really enjoying the episodes. I don't know if Mike will be able to answer this since he is someone who has had many accomplishments, but here it goes. I just turned 30. I haven't really done much with my life. I have been fired from every job except for my current one. I don't make enough money to qualify for even a studio apartment in my city. Though I do have a bachelor's degree and am earning my master's, I am single and obese. I have quit smoking weed and drinking. I listen to successful people, but all I hear is survivorship bias. Do you have any advice? Well, this is a, it's a tough one, but um, there's only, there's a few simple truths in life. Um, and while well, there's many, many truths in life, but a lot of simple truths in life that need to be lived by that all of us human beings struggle through, go through. Doesn't matter if you're the most in shape person, the most obese, obese person. Doesn't mean if you're the most broke person, the most wealthy person on the planet. Doesn't mean if you are the, doesn't matter if you are the most loved person on the planet or the loneliest person on the planet. Our decisions and our actions are the things that are either holding us back or springing us forward to those things that we want. You guys hear me quote the book all the time, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. Um, number one, Jessica, I would say that's always my first recommendation for anybody who is struggling uh, with anything whatsoever. I think every single human being should read this book. It's a very easy read, very quick read. It's 40 something pages. You can get off get it off of Amazon right now. So if you're driving, um, Sock this away in the back of your head. Of your head, if you are sitting down, listen to this. Write it down. As a man thinketh, by James Allen. It's a book written many, many, many years ago, at the turn of the century in the 1900s, early 1900s. Um, and James Allen, the overarching theme of that book is: As a man thinketh, so he will become. As a woman thinketh, so she will become. It's about taking ownership of your life through the thoughts that turn into actions, and the actions that turn into the series of events that happen in your life. Too often we believe that we are living in a 
unfair, uh, flying by the seat of our pants, the universe or people around me are conspiring against me. And this is why I have so many bad things happening to me in life when really our thoughts turn into actions and our actions turn into the entirety or the totality of our life and our human existence. The season that we are in right now, yes, there are going to be outliers. There are going to be people that have done us wrong. There are going to be bad circumstances or bad luck, so to speak. But those that believe that we are living by good luck and bad luck and in between luck uh, alone are those that are just wandering generalities instead of a meaningful specific. So Jessica, you talk about being fired from every job, not making enough money to even afford a studio apartment. Um, you have a bachelor's degree and you're going for your master's degree. You're single, you're overweight. Um, but then the next one, the next quote or the next line right there says, I have quit smoking, re smoking weed and drinking. Number one, anybody who has engaged in drinking too much or too often or smoking weed or other drugs too often. And it was getting into the way of their work, getting in the way of their career, getting in the way of the relationships. It was definitely time to stop. And instead of going in and um, looking at, at that, all those years that maybe you wasted smoking weed, all those years that you wasted drinking too much, all those jobs that you did lose, all those moments you did walk into your boss's um, office and you did get fired, he or she telling you that you weren't enough to continue to pursue the job or continue to meet the standard of the job that you were in. Instead of looking at those things like they're a negative, look at them as a positive season of your life because you are a new creation every single day. And that weed smoking, overweight, drinking too much, fired from too many jobs, don't have enough money to qualify for your studio apartment in the city that you live in. That was who you were yesterday. And yesterday really did end last night and the sun really did come up this morning. And there's so much more time than you think there is to become who you, you were fashioned to be, who, who you were created to be. The fact that you say you were smoking weed, you were drinking, pat yourself on the back that's saying you were doing those things. You have quit. You made a decision and hopefully you are sticking to that commitment. So you need to pat yourself on the back and say that right there is a huge victory. Now it's time to move into today, move into tomorrow, move into this week, next week, and this month, and this entire rest of the, the year as a new creation, as somebody who is different in the present and in the future than you were in the past. Sounds to me I, like there's a lot of self-image issues here. Sounds to me like there's going to be lack of discipline. There's going to be lack of follow through. There's going to be lack of commitment. And all of that can be helped through positive self-talk, which turns into a positive self-image, getting into the right books, the right podcasts, the right journaling, the right diet, the right movement. Doesn't need to be a one hour crazy P90X circuit training at your local gym in front of a bunch of people, but it could be getting up and walking around the block and then walking around the block two, two times and then walking around the block three times. Before you know it, you're walking a mile. Before you know it, you're walking three miles. Before you know it, that walk turns into a, a brisk walk and that brisk walk turns into a light jog and that light jog turns into a decent jog and that decent jog turns into a long jog or a long run. Brick by boring brick, we build the life that we always wanted and we think that we are created for. I listened to Tim Grover speak. If you guys don't know who Tim Grover is, look him up. He was Michael Jordan's coach, Kobe Bryant's coach, Kevin Durant's coach, uh, or maybe, sorry, maybe not Kevin Durant, um, Dwayne Wade's coach. A lot of high, high level athletes. And um, what, he, what he was talking about a lot was not worrying about the past because if you're worrying about the past, you can't be present in the present and then be present in the future. And as I talked about 
becoming the person that you were fashioned to be or the person that you were created to be. He, he, he stood there in a room full of a hundred people, me included. Um, and he even kind of looked at me during the time that he was saying it, my eyes welled up with tears because he said, I can't tell you how to be great. I couldn't tell Michael Jordan how to be great. I couldn't tell um, or teach those guys how to be great because greatness is already inside of you. Every single person that is listening right now, this is Tim Grover, one of the greatest coaches on the entire planet, coached the highest level of people. He said, I'm not here to motivate people. I'm here to elevate people because you already have greatness inside of you. And Jessica and everybody who is listening to this to this bot podcast right now, who is struggling with some of the same things that Jessica is because millions of people, hundreds of millions of people are struggling with the exact same thing, lack of follow through, overweight, which means that's lack of energy, which means it's a lack of energy in your relationships, lack of self-worth, self-worth, lack of self-image. You've got to get your priorities straight. And your number one priority isn't your next job. It isn't making them enough money to get to uh, that studio apartment. It's not finding a relationship because you're single. It's not even losing weight because you're obese. It is loving yourself more. And how do you love yourself more? You make promises to yourself every single day, follow through on said promises. So then you can trust yourself. When you can trust yourself, then you're going to walk into your next job as a person who trusts themselves. You're going to put on your walking shoes and walk around the block a couple times as a person who can trust themselves. When you write it down, you make a list of things that says, hey, I'm doing this tomorrow. And it could be as simple as brushing your teeth, making your bed, eating eggs instead of a pastry, eating eggs and avocado instead of going to the McDonald's drive through drinking a black coffee or a coffee with maybe a little bit of cream in it with a little bit of sugar and not a ton of sugar, or instead of that $9, 900 calorie Starbucks drink with whipped cream that you're wasting money on, putting empty calories into your body. And it's ultimately making you feel like crap every single morning. So this question is from Jessica from a city unknown, but I believe this question is encompassing a lot of people's ailments in life right now. Can't keep a steady job. They're low on income because they can't keep a steady job. They're overweight because they can't keep a steady job and they can't show up and serve other people, serve that job, serve their higher ups. And yes, we do need to serve our higher ups. You don't think I haven't gotten to where I am today by thinking about, okay, I fought for Bellator. How can I serve Scott Coker, Rich Chu, Mike Kogan? How can I serve this promotion? Yes, there was a selfish ambition there. I wanted to be world champion. I wanted to be best in the world. I wanted to win the fights. But ultimately, I was serving the promotion that I was fighting under. And now, everything has been magnified times 100, serving Dana White, serving Hunter Campbell, Sean Shelby, and the under and the other... Mick Maynard and the other 150 employees of the UFC. I am selfishly ambitious to be the world champion, to beat Conor McGregor later this year, because that's about me and me accomplishing my goal. But ultimately, I have to be a good employee first. I've said this 25 times on this microphone right here. Jim Rohn said back in the day, back when the minimum wage was a lot, a lot cheaper, minimum wage was a lot lower. He said, they'll pay you $4 to work at McDonald's, but they'll pay you four and a quarter to take the trash out with a smile on your face. The overarching lesson there is being a good employee, serving others, doing what you said you were going to do. That's all that matters in life. If you do what you say you're going to do, your self-image increases. When you do what you say you're going to do, you will be happier, you will be healthier, you will be harder to kill. When you do what your contract says, when you sign on the dotted line, you show up early, you do your hard work, you do what needs to be done, you're going to get pats on the back. You're going to get positive reinforcement. You're going to get smiles instead of smirks. You're going to get people wanting to be attracted to you, whether it be actually physically, sexually attracted, or whether it be 
attracted to you in a business sense, they want to do business with you. They want to have you on the next project. They want to seek you out to work with them. The overarching theme in this question is we've got to win the battle between our ears. I've had things happen to me in my past or told to me in the past or self-fulfilling, self-defeating prophecies and self-deprecating thoughts and actions that were ingrained in my mind that I've had to reverse out of my mind. I always talk about the small guy from the small town who was taught to do small things. I will never, ever maybe be able to kill that guy. That's a dragon I may never be able to slay, but I can get really good at pushing him into a corner, really good at managing him. And whatever it is that you're going through, you have to get through the, you have to get to the root cause of what is holding you back. Why you're overweight, why you're single, why you can't keep a job. You can find a job. Anybody can find a job, but why you can't keep a job. It all goes back to gratitude being fake, thankful for that for which you do have, not those things that you don't have, because maybe, quite frankly, you don't deserve the things that you truly want. None of us deserve the things that we truly want unless we're willing to put the time, energy, effort in, operate in integrity, operate in character, be punctual, show up on time, work our face off, and be recognized and noticed that way because we did what we said we were going to, were going to do. And quite frankly, these days, boys and girls, there are so many people who are not willing to do what they say they were going to do that it's actually easier to be successful these days than it was 50 years ago. The level, the level of work ethic has continued to go down and down and down. So use that as an opportunity to be the person that stands out. I believe I am where I'm at. I am at in my career because of the way that I have operated how I've been able to stand out amongst my peers, how I've been able to stand out and do the right thing when so many people wanted to cut corners, show up on time or even early when everybody else is showing up late. Saying that they will work one hour and then they actually slack off and only do 45 minutes or they say they're going to do 10 of these and they only do eight and then they slack off. When guys like me and the people out there that you guys admire are willing to put in more than that one hour that we said we were going to do, more than those 10 that we were going to do. Get the book, As a Man Thinketh, every single one of you right now, today. It's not my book. It's, I'm not promoting it. I'm not selling it. I'm just, it's just a book that I have with me at all times. I just took, a, I took two trips this week, went out to LA, came back, went out to San Diego, came back, all within one week. And all four of my plane trips I picked up the book, As a Man Thinketh, opened it up, found the different areas that I've underlined and highlighted because every single word and every single sentence, every single chapter in that book will help you become a better human being because we can blame it on things all we want. We can blame it on our parents. I've done that. We can blame it on our circumstances. I've done that. We can blame it on our shortcomings because of other people. I've done that. We can blame it on the people who have done us wrong. I've done that. But it all goes back to you taking control of your life. The Calvary is not coming. There is nobody coming to save you. There's nobody coming to save you. You are on your own here on this planet. And the more that you think like that, the more you become a more sovereign individual, a more self-sufficient individual, and then start attracting other people around you that you can do life with. The people that you desire to be around, you have to give them a reason to want to desire you to be around them. Jessica, I wish you well. Pat yourself on the back. Be proud of yourself that you've quit smoking. You've quit drinking. And make a list. Get that book. Make a list of things that you're going to do tomorrow. Three things, five things, and check those things off your list. And then do it again the next day, the next day, and the next day. Because what you have, I believe, is a self-image issue, which we all have. A lot of us have. I don't know if you'll ever be able to fully, fully slay some dragons that you have. Like I said, we all have different areas of our self-image that we need to work on. And you have, number two, you have a trust issue. You don't trust yourself. But an untrustworthy individual can become a trustworthy individual. It just takes energy and effort and belief in yourself. So Jessica, I wish you well. I love you. I know good things are going to happen for you. Greatness is inside of you. You were created for so much more 
than you could ever think or imagine. You just have to get yourself into a position where you start believing it. So best of luck, Jessica. And thank you for a very candid question. Um, these are the kind of questions that I love. And maybe some of that is hard truths. And maybe some of that is things that you don't want to hear, but that's what we always do. Tim Grover, who spoke last weekend, um, just a couple of days ago, also said, we all walk around with skeletons, but that, that's why they talk. That's why they call them skeletons in the closet. We want to put the, push those skeletons in the closet closet. We want to lock the door, close it, lock the door so nobody can see them so that we don't have to see them, so that we don't have to deal with them. So the sooner that we start dealing with the things that are truly ailing us, the sooner we start dealing with the things that are truly holding us back, the sooner we start wearing our heart on our sleeve and walking around with our skeletons and saying, yeah, I did fall short here. Yeah, I did do that. Yeah, I did say that. Yes, I am that, or I was that. But that's an old story. That chapter of, that li of my life has been closed and now I can move on to the next one. So hopefully you guys found some value in that. And I'm speaking to myself in a lot of diff different areas because I've struggled with a lot of things in my life. And I have wanted to push those skeletons in that closet and lock, lock, a, lock the door and throw away the key so many times. But until I actually deal with them, then I was able, until I actually dealt with them, then I was able to start turning a corner. Next question comes from William. Hi, Mike. I'm a young boxer from Denmark who is very inspired by your work ethic and determination. My question is, what does a typical training day look like for you? How many sessions and what kind of training? I'm a big fan of yours. Keep up the good work, champ. Well, William, uh, training for me looks different often um, depending on what season I am in, depending on training camp or out of training camp. When I'm in training camp, I'm training twice a day sick five days a week. And then once on Saturday, um, always pro practices in the morning, hard pro practices at night. It's individual stuff. Um, cause you got to get the sparring in, you got to get the, the hard grappling, hard wrestling in, obviously you're a boxer. So, um, William, I don't know how to train as a, as a boxer. Um, but I would definitely be doing sparring a couple days a week. Um, and not always hard, hard sparring, sometimes lighter sparring, sometimes flow sparring, sometimes quick reaction drills, footwork, distance, timing. Um, and then always strength, strength and conditioning twice a week, lifting weights, lifting heavier weights, lifting lighter weights, very fast, doing a lot of reps, muscular endurance, um, a lot of jumps, a lot of hops, a lot of sprints is what my strength and conditioning look like. Looks like obviously you guys, um, a lot of you have probably taken a look at it or even members of walk on fitness, my walk on fitness app where we have numerous programs. Um, you can, go, you can check that out at walkonfit.com. Um, and then, um, individual stuff at night and then hard training in the morning, longer training in the morning, lighter at night, five days a week. And then one workout on Saturday, take Sunday off and then do it all over again. I do that for 10 weeks or so leading up to a fight right now I'm outside of training camp. So worked out this morning at eight, did strength and conditioning. And then, um, today I'm just doing one, one workout. So right now when I'm outside of training camp, most, most days I'm only training once to stay in shape, work on skills, uh, get better, but also not beat up my body too much. Cause I still want to stay fresh. Um, want to mitigate over training when I'm outside of training camp. And then when I get, once I get into training camp, then it's two days or two training days or two training sessions per day. Um, five or six days a week. Um, but the big thing is nutrition and supplementation, uh, walk on fit.com. You guys can see all of my nutrition guidelines that I have. We have a couple diets on there as well. Um, it's widely known. I use mega fit meals, uh, as my nutrition program. Uh, William, I don't know if they go to Denmark. Actually, I'm pretty sure they don't go to Denmark. Um, but find a local meal prep company that can do your meals for you. High protein, lots of vegetables, make sure you're getting your micronutrients. Uh, you said I'm a young boxer, not sure how young you are. Um, I did just get my blood work checked where they checked all of my, um, vitamins and minerals, uh, checked, you know, liver, they checked, um, checked liver, kidneys and all that kind of stuff. Checked my hormone levels, testosterone levels, all of those different, all those different biomarkers, because a lot of those things can be changed or increased or optimized naturally through just food and supplementation. So find a local expert there if you can, nutritionist, eating right 
for performance as well as for muscle gain or fat loss or becoming a better athlete is much more important than the actual training is. I can, you can never over, you can never out train a bad diet and it's unfortunate. It really is. I wish God designed us where if, as long as we just did a workout every day, we could stay ripped, stay lean, stay jacked, but you just can't. It's unfortunate. Alcohol consumption, eating bad food, eating fast food, eating a lot of carbohydrates. Um, that stuff is just never, ever going to lead to the body that you want, unfortunately. Um, you know, and I would actually say too, that as you're training, listen to your body just because I'm doing two a days, um, doesn't mean that you should be only working out once a day. That's when I'm in my training camps. I am a professional fighter. That is my prof profession. That is how I put food on the table for my family. So of course, that's all I'm doing, training twice a day. So, but right now when I'm outside of training camp, I'm training once a day. So good question, William. I appreciate it. And to the, all you other athletes or mixed martial artists or boxers or martial, uh, martial artists in general, or anybody competing at a high level, um, I hope that helped you. Next question from Elias. Hey, Michael, as a young 18 year old upcoming man who sometimes struggles with anxiety and who often struggles to get up and motivate himself, I want to ask you, what do you think is the best way to motivate oneself, even though you are feeling down and you are in a depressed mood? What are your tips tr and tricks for this situation? God bless you and your family. See you at the top. Elias. Well, Elias, um, it's a good question. There's a lot of people out there struggling with anxiety and depression. Um, I think, I think there's an interesting relationship between how often we use the words anxiety and we use the word depression um, these days because we talk about it a lot more. And it could be the fact that we're trying to bring light to it and we're trying to actually admit it, which is a good thing. You need to admit it. You need to admit that you need help. You need to admit that you're feeling anxious or you're feeling unmotivated or you're feeling depressed, you need to admit those things. So then you can take the steps necessary to become unanxious, to become undepressed, to become more motivated, to become more elevated, to become a better version of yourself. But I can't tell if it's because we are talking about it so much more because of social media and we hear it a lot more and it seems like it's being admitted a lot more. And also the relationship between that and the amount of people out there who are not eating correctly or the amount of people out there who want to be their own boss and they don't have bosses holding them accountable. They don't have nine to five jobs. A lot of them, they are out there being freelancers and they can kind of make their own hours and they can stay up late and they can do all these different things that are not always conducive to a healthy lifestyle and a healthy body and a healthy positive self image. Um, so the question is, what do I, what do you do or what is the best way to motivate yourself when you're feeling depressed? And the biggest thing you guys have heard me talk about this a lot on this show is I woke up this morning at 5 a.m. I made a commitment to myself that this week I was going to wake up every single day at 5 a.m. And I'm not saying you have to wake up at 5 a.m. Most of the time I wake up about 5.55, just enough time to get up, get my coffee, write in my gratitude journal, read my two devotionals, and it gives you a nice 20 minutes or so before my kids wake up. Today I wanted to have a nice hour and a half before my kids woke up because I'm feeling extra motivated, if you will. Um, as we said, Tim Grover said he doesn't like to use the word motivation. He likes to use the word elevation because quite frankly, Elias and every single one of you guys that is listening and even you, Michael, talking to myself here, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be motivated. Most of us are in good health. Most of us have two arms and two legs. Most of us have well-enabled bodies. Most of us have, live in countries in which we have the abilities to do anything we want with our life for the most part. So how the heck can we not have motivation? But I think we, we start to lose motivation when we are not operating in gratitude. So I woke up this morning and I'm feeling great today because I got a nice hour and a half to write in my gratitude journal, to write in my planner what I'm doing this week. Um, the couple different things that we are doing this week that we want to get done and the checking things off the list, going back to Jessica's question, me, be, me being able to check already four or five things off of the list and it's only 11.45 a.m. here in Nashville, Tennessee, um, has got me feeling really good. 
It's got me feeling really good about myself, but it always goes back to gratitude. Woke up this morning, did my devotionals, drank my coffee, and I wrote two full pages in my journal. One was a gratitude entry, and then the next one was more of a visualization um, entry, how I want to see myself, what I want to be, what I want to do, what I want to have. So the fact that I was able to see those things in my mind's eye this morning before the sun even came up, before my wife woke up, before my boys woke up, um, has got me in a really good mood, has got me in a forward thinking state of mind. So what do you do when you feel unmotivated or depressed? Start thinking about how grateful, grateful you are for the things that you do have. As I said earlier, being grateful for that which you do have and not the things that which you don't have. Because in order to get the things that you don't have, you must first be grateful for the things that you do have. He who can be trusted with a little can then and only then be trusted with a lot. I repeat that. You can't, or in a different way, you can't be trusted with a lot. The big things, the big opportunities, the big success, the big stages, the big lights, the big platforms, the big amounts of money, the big amounts of relationships, the big things in life. You cannot get to those big things unless you are first able to be trusted with the small things. How are you handling your current job that you have? How are you handling your current relationships that you have? How are you currently, how are you handling your current relationship with yourself? Do you do what you say you're going to do? Going back to the question, the first question of this podcast, doing what you say you're going to do, seeing through to that commitment that you made is the best way to gain trust in yourself. You gain trust in yourself. You increase your self-image. You increase your self-image. Every single aspect of your life increases. It's a virtual certainty. It might not be a crazy leaps and bounds going from zero to a hundred million tomorrow just by getting a better self-image. But you can go from zero to one, one to two, two to three, three to six, six to 12, 12 to 24, and then it starts to multiply, multiply 24 to 48 before you know you're at 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 400. And then it's the law of multiplication just by making these small tweaks every single day, waking up with gratitude, saying, thank you, Lord, for this, or thank you, universe, for that, whatever it is that you believe in whatever your higher power is, whatever your higher being is, your entity is, thank you that I have this. Thank you that I have this health. Thank you that I have this roof over my head. Thank you that I'm sitting in these comfy pajamas right now. Thank you that I got to sleep in a bed last night. Thank you that I'm not worried where my next meal is coming from. Thank you for this relationship in my life. Thank you for the things that I do have. And yes, I want things much bigger than what I have now. And yes, I want to have a lot more relationships than I do have now. And yes, I want to live in a bigger house than I have now and a nicer car than I have now. And yes, I want to find the woman of my dreams if I haven't found her yet. Yes, I want to have the dream job or the dream occupation or the dream business that I want to run. But how are you ever going to run a business if you weren't first a good employee? If you weren't first showing up signing on the dotted line saying, yes, I will do X, Y, and Z. And then not just doing X, Y, and do X, Y, and Z, but doing more than just X, Y, and Z to climb that ladder, to gain more trust in yourself, to have a better self-concept, to see the person in the mirror saying that man or that woman deserves more and more success. And brick by brick, we build the life that we wanted. So Elias, gratitude journal in the morning, Write down five things that you can do that you know are low-hanging fruit that you can get done in your life that are accomplishments. Make sure you take care of your physical body. Take care of your mental state. Visualize and see a better life for yourself. See more things being accomplished. See more barriers being broken. See more doubters being silenced. Whatever it is that motivates you, why you want to be successful, visualize those things. Going back to what I said earlier, a lot of times we are unmotivated, we are depressed, we are anxious because we are not operating in gratitude. Last thing I would say is serve other people. I opened this show with you with Zig's quote, Zig Ziglar, you can have everything you want in life if you, if you will just help enough other people get what they want in life. 
And it's not just about getting things. It's not just about giving things so you can get things. It's about giving to others, serving others so that you can reap the, re the rewards of the positive benefits of that good feeling that you have when you serve other people. A lot of times we are anxious, unmotivated, depressed because we're thinking about ourselves way too much and we're not thinking about others enough. Great question, Elias. I appreciate it. Next one comes from Ansar. Hey, Mike, love your insight on topics you speak about. My question is, when does a boy become a man? Is it when he gets his first job, when he gets his first girlfriend, when he's when he marries her, when he has kids, etc.? I am currently 19 years old and I am still feeling like a young kid, even though I'm technically an adult. Would love to hear your thoughts. Good luck on Tough 31. Tough 31, The Ultimate Fighter, comes out on ESPN this summer, May 30th to August 15th. Um, figured I'd do that plug right there so you guys know, because it was a phenomenal show. And uh, there was a lot of young guys on that show. There were some older guys on that show. Um, so it kind of goes into your question. So it's actually a really, really darn good question. When does a boy become a man? When he gets his first job, his first girlfriend, when he gets married, when he has kids, you know, you can, you can insert anything here, makes a million dollars or becomes a business owner or has the car of his dreams or, um, he's 30, he's 25. What age is that? Honestly, it's a really hard question to answer because I can tell you similar to Ansar said, I'm currently 19 years old and I still feel like a young kid, even though I'm technically an adult. I think at 19 years old, I didn't feel like a man yet. You know, I think it's funny. These 16 year old kids walking around swagger, 18 years old, walking around swagger, 22 years old, walking around swagger, acting like a man. I'm a grown man. I'm a man. And a lot of times they're, the work that they have put in, the work that they are putting in, the things that they have accomplished, if you will, accomplished is a hard word to say because there's some 19 year olds out, out there right now selling gummy bears on TikTok, making millions of dollars. Does that make them a man? 16 year old, 16 year old YouTubers out there right now making millions of dollars on YouTube. Does that make them a man? I don't know. I think you become a man when you start acting like a man. What does it take to be a man? Well, there's a few simple things that you have to do day in and day out to be a man. Just because you're 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, doesn't mean you're an actual man. Biologically, you're a man. I do think biologically, you're either a man or a woman. Just go ahead and get that out there. I don't care who, who I uh, upset. Biologically, you are a man or a woman. But when are you a man? When you start acting like a man. Do you want to serve others? Do you want to provide for yourself and provide for a family if you do have a family? Are you seeing through to your commitment? Are you showing up on time? Are you someone that someone can rely on? Are you someone that most people would say, hey, that guy right there, he's reliable. That guy right there, he said he was going to be here at seven, so he's going to be here at seven. That guy right there said he's going to deliver this by this date. I believe he's going to do it. You have to be reliable. You will fail and you will fail often and you will have momentary lapses of judgment. You will make mistakes. Admit when you're wrong. That's what a man does. A man admits when he is wrong. A man admits what he is wrong, when he is wrong. Maybe he feels bad about it. He apologizes. He writes it down and says, what could I have done better here? What could I have done differently here? How do I become a better man and make sure this doesn't ever happen again? Because... The regret and the shame or the guilt that you might feel from not doing the right thing, we all feel those things. But men operate in the view of their commitment that they, that they made, not to their feelings, not to their emotions. The quest for self-mastery, being the master of yourself, being controllable, in your emotions. Can I control my emotions? Can I control my outbursts? Can I control myself in these different scenarios? And as I would say, we all go through different seasons. There are different seasons where our self-image is down in the dumps because of something that has happened or certain things that have happened or things that have been done to us. 
trying to make sure you're not being perfect. No man is perfect. No man has ever walked the face of this earth as perfect, except for Jesus Christ himself. We are all sinners saved by grace. We are all flawed individuals. Admitting that is part of being a man. But going back to what I was saying kind of earlier before that, I think when I was 19 years old, I didn't feel like a man either. Still in college, I was wrestling. Um, you know, the army could have sent me off and drafted me, or I could have signed up for the army, or I could have, uh, you know, I was driving a car, all these different things that says, quote unquote, you are a man now at 18 years old. But I really, my answer to this question is I truly felt like a man. It's hard to think when I actually really started feeling like a man, I think for me, my self image, like I said, you guys know my story, small guy, small town, small things. So it was hard for me to see myself as a man when I still saw myself as a small guy from a small town who was taught to do small things until I was able to take control of that and realize, wait a second, I'm not that little guy from that little town anymore. I'm different. I've graduated. I've not just graduated high school or graduated college. I've graduated to a new level of my human existence. So once again, I think being a man really goes, goes into how you see yourself. Are you reliable? Do you show up and do what you say you're going to do? Are you a person that deserves to be trusted? Are you a trustworthy individual to get the job done? to see through to your commitment. Integrity. The definition of integrity is doing what you say you're going to do. That's it. That's all you have to do is do what you say you're going to do. And most people just don't. And I, millions of times in my life, have fallen short of that. I said I was going to do this and it didn't happen. And I'm not just talking about winning the world title. I'm not just talking about winning this fight. I'm not just talking about these goals that I had and I didn't reach them. I'm talking about simple things that exude character and integrity. So Ansar, the biggest thing I would say here is the fact that you're even asking this question puts a smile on my face because at 19 years old, you are in this, you're in this gray area between boy and man, but you're asking the question, when does a man become a man? A man becomes a man when he operates like a man every single day. He's not perfect. He will fall short, but he sees through to his commitments. He shows up on time. He works extremely hard. He safeguards the helpless. He helps people. He serves others. And he sees through to the commitments that he makes every single day. He can trust himself. He's a trustworthy individual. So for everybody listening right now, I'd like to thank Ansar for even asking this question because I know our audience is, is a lot of men And you don't become a man just because you turned 18. You don't become a man just because you turned a certain age. You become a man when you start operating like a man, when you start carrying yourself like a man. And I can tell you this right now, we need a lot more real men in this world. We need a lot more real men in this world because there are a lot of boys, well, there are a lot of boys out there masquerading as men. There are a lot of boys out there with that swagger, with a couple bucks in the bank account, driving a nice car, flashing it all on YouTube, acting like they're men. But when it actually came down to it, I wouldn't want to be in a foxhole with them. I wouldn't want to have them as the person walking into a precarious situation with them. And I'm not just talking about them being able to fight or defend themselves from an attacker or any of those kind of tough guy things. Cause it's very easy for me to talk like that. Cause I'm a mixed martial artist. I'm talking about someone who is reliable, someone who is intentional, someone who is full of character, full of integrity, and is a trustworthy individual. But Ansar, I can guarantee you will be a great man. You are a great young man right now, and you will be a great man because you're even asking the question. You have the desire. We have to admit where we need to get better, and then we have to ask questions. And the questions that we ask are a beautiful indicator of where our heart is and where our heart's desire is. We need good men in this world. And sorry, you will be one of them. I know, I'm lis- I know a lot of listeners right now are those kind of men because you wouldn't be here today listening to me 
ramble on and talk about being a man unless you had at least an inkling of desire to be a better man. Ask yourself that question every single day. I ask myself that a lot, or I tell myself that a lot. It sounds narcissistic, but I write it down often. I might've actually wrote it yesterday because I wasn't feeling phenomenal about myself or certain areas of my life. And I wanted to write down, Michael, you are a great man. How many men out there would say that you are a great man? And I just kind of was like writing those kind of things down. And like I said, it sounds narcissistic. It sounds, sounds cocky, but is there anything wrong with me believing that I'm a good man? while also believing that I could get better in a lot of areas. But ultimately, I know where my heart is. I know where my character is. I know where my integrity is. I know my desire is to be better every single day. It's a great question. Next question comes from Shay. Hey, Michael, thanks for taking the time to reflect on my question. I am a sophomore in high school from a small town in North Carolina. I've been in deep thought a lot lately as I grasp how time is flying by and my only and my only brother is going to graduate in a couple of months and I will be the only kid in the house next year. I am noticing that my childhood window is beginning to beginning to close and a new chapter is on the horizon. I know I will be, be prepared for that chapter. That's not my worry. I am wondering if you could give some insight on getting the most out of these final years and making sure you expand on the memories you make with the people who care about the people that you care about before everyone goes their separate ways, leaving no shoulda, woulda, coulda moments on the table when I look back in my older years. Appreciating and embracing all the moments as this is a one of a kind period of our lives. Thank you for these great videos that I listen to to start my day and give me some great things to think about and jot down to share with others. Your mentality and message is something I idolize and strive to replicate in my life. You are my favorite fighter in and out of the cage, and I wish you luck in your tough competition and fight against Connor. I know I will be jumping around and rooting like hell for you. Appreciate you for being you, and I will see you at the top. Shay. Well, Shay, you are awesome. Appreciate the kind words. Um, so let's start from the very beginning. So a sophomore in high school. So Shay is somewhere around 16, 17 years old. Um, right before this, we just talked to Ansar, who was 19, talking about when does a man become a man? Um, and Shay right now going through that that period of time kind of in the middle of high school where, you know, you're kind of in middle school, you look up to all the older kids who were in high school, you couldn't wait to get to high school. Then all of a sudden you get to high school, then halfway through, you realize, holy cow, this thing's almost over or halfway over. I need to start cherishing these memories. I need to start cherishing their, these relationships. I need to maximize this time that I have um, with the people that I have in my life. Um, getting the most out of these final years, making sure to expand on the memories that you have with the people, making sure there are no shoulda, woulda, coulda moments. I appreciate the question or I appreciate, I appreciate the, the insight of how do I make sure there weren't any woulda, shoulda, coulda moments. Number one is making, making it clear that most likely every aspect of your life, every season of your life Every relationship of your life, every endeavor of your life, there's always room for the human condition sometimes to take over and say, well, I wish I would have done that. I wish I should have, should have done that. Or, hey, I could have done this or I could have done that. The woulda, shoulda, coulda game is so tough because no matter what, even the most successful of ambitions and the most successful of pursuits, always there's always room for shoulda, woulda, couldas in a lot of different areas. And I don't say that to, I don't say that to discourage you. Uh, I say that to give somewhat of a glimpse that even in my best performances, even in my biggest moments of platform, biggest moments of success, there was always ways that I could look back and say, well, I wish I wish I would have done this or wish shoulda, 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 woulda, coulda. Um, and I think I did that a lot early in my career. And then I've since learned to curb that a little bit and just be happy with the success. You guys have heard me talk about success, not perfection. Making sure that we are, our aim is not perfection. Perfection, striving for protect, perfection only leads to pain. But if we're aiming just for success, if we're aiming for trying our best, being successful, being 1% better today, 1% better tomorrow, compounding all the way till the end of an endeavor to make it a success, that's where our thoughts need to be. That's where our mentality needs to be. 
but Shay, as you know, as I kind of went through the progression of wanting to be in a high school and then all of a sudden you get to high school and realize, okay, shoot, now I'm a sophomore. Um, you know, here we are April. So we're toward the end of your sophomore year, possibly even your, or no, the end of your sophomore year. Um, maybe you're 16, maybe you're almost 17, somewhere in that age, starting to drive, starting to really, I think this is a very important time in a young man's life or a young woman's life when we're really trying to figure out who we are. Because as we said, we all think that we become a man at 18 years old and then you get kicked out of the house maybe, or you get go off to college and become an adult, if you will. A lot of times these days, I think we're starting to see that, uh, you know, that age is being pushed further and further back, which is funny because even me as a, as a father right now, I'm like, yeah, I don't want my kids to leave at 18. I would love for them to stick around a lot longer than that. You know, it really brings the perspective back to Mike and Betty Chandler, my mom and dad, you know how they probably saw us and how sad they were when we left at 18 years old, but that's neither here nor there. But, um, you're in that middle of high school years where all of a sudden, no oh shoot. Now two years is almost over and I only have two years left. And then what's next. And all these people that are in my life and the people that I think are my, my best friends for life or the people that I think are, you know, the girl that I think I want to marry or the boy that I guy that I think I want to marry those high school sweethearts. Are they going to be there forever? Are they not going to be there forever? Am I going to lose touch with them? Am I going to stay in touch with them? Different strokes for different folks. There's going to be certain people that you're going to be friends with for the rest of your life. There's going to be certain people that are your best friends right now, your closest group of people that you're with right now that you will grow away from. But you just don't know about that tomorrow season, that next season, until it gets here. So I would just say, enjoy the moment, enjoy the moment right now, because I'm trying to think, I mean, some people would say high school was the best years of my life. Some people would say college was the best years of my life. Um, I think for me, college was the best years of my life, even though I was married to the sport of wrestling. I was in the wrestling room every single day, didn't engage in a lot of the things that a lot of the guys around me on the team that were engaging in. Um, I missed out on what a lot of people would call the college experience, but I was doing what I knew I wanted to do, which was pursue becoming a national champion, which I fell short of, but I knew it wasn't because of lack of try. It was because of lack of self-image. It was because of lack of self-belief, but it was not because of lack of try which I then worked on my self-image after that and realized that was the most important aspect of me ever trying to become a champion at, at anything. But Shay, I would just say, enjoy, enjoy the moment. The freedoms that you have, the lack of um, financial, I mean, the lack of financial burden that you have right now. You know, I imagine obviously you're living at home with your parents. Most likely I shouldn't assume, but I can only assume here you're a sophomore in high school in a small town in, town in North Carolina. Enjoy being in a small town in North Carolina. It's a beautiful area of the country, even though I know it's your hometown. So you probably think it, it stinks, but there's a lot worse places to be than uh, North Carolina. Enjoy not having the responsibilities that you will have just in two, three, four years time. So then before you know it, you have to get a job to start supporting yourself. Before you know it, you've got the demands of the said job. You've got the responsibilities of maybe rent, maybe a mortgage, maybe working two jobs. You got the responsibility of being an 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old, because there is more and more responsibility of just having that age next to your name. So when you're 16 years old, you can get away with anything. 16 years old, you can, you can sleep in and be a lump on a log and everyone just says, well, he's 16. He's being a lump on a log as being a 16 year old. But before you know it, a couple of years from now, you can't do that. The older you get, the more responsibility you have and the higher the standard is for your human existence. But don't necessarily take advantage of being young and being 16 and being a lump on a log if you want to and sleeping in. Be someone who's a leader at your high school at your small town in North Carolina. Be a leader. Be, be that person who is the head of the team, the head of the group, the head of the, the faction that you hang out with. The people that say, man, Shay, they got that thing, man. Whatever they're doing, I kind of want to do that. Wherever they're going, I kind of want to do that. 
get good grades, show up to class, do the right thing. Be a man or woman of integrity, a man or woman of, of, of character. Be, be different. I was a small guy from a small town. Probably not different than the small town in North Carolina that you're from. But because I was small, I always just kind of was a follower. I was just, and I didn't, I, I knew right from wrong. I didn't follow kids into doing bad things. But I didn't really take that leadership role because I was smaller. I was a 103 pounder as a freshman, 112 as a sophomore, 135 as a junior, 152, and finally started to become like a normal size human being. And I thought, okay, maybe I can be a little bit of a leader now. I was a leader on my wrestling team, leader in the community good grades, showed up on time, good reputation. Start building the foundation of a good reputation right now. But the insight on getting the most out of these final years, that's what I would say. And it didn't say in here, if you were part of a sports team or part of any clubs or part of any passion projects or whatnot, if it's not sports, which I highly encourage a lot of people to do. I think organized sports has made me into who I am. It's not for everybody, but I loved organized sports, wrestling, football, baseball. Um, and then obviously I wrestled in college. I loved being part of a team, the hierarchy of a team, someone nipping at your heels, trying to take your spot, you trying to take the spot of the person in front of you, becoming a leader, the accountability, a coach barking orders at you, breathing down your neck. It's very, it's a very, very good litmus test for how you're going to do in life when you have a boss, when you have a job, when you have other organizations that you're a part of. But if you're not part of organized sports, Shay, be in student council. If it's arts, be in arts classes, music classes, whatever, whatever you are passionate about, dabble in different things and vocalize that. Hopefully your parents are supportive or if they're not supportive of it at least voice it, at least try to become part of something, become part of something. Don't just go to school and then come home from school at two 30 or three in the afternoon and then hang out till dinner and then fall asleep and do it all over again. Idle hands are the devil's playground. Be busy, be busy with other people, do other things, be a part of, be a part of groups and organizations teams be a part of something because that's how you really create those those lasting moments with people that you may or may not be friends with for the rest of your life but appreciating and embracing all the moments as this is a one of a kind period of your life quoting you there it is a one of a kind period of your life my mentor chris patterson who i uh quoted earlier or mentioned earlier he always said enjoy this moment michael this is the least busy that you'll ever be. And I was like, what the heck are you talking about, dude? You know, I think when he first said it, I was, I was single, maybe living in Las Vegas. Um, cause that's where I started my career, left Missouri, went to, La went to Las Vegas, trained at extreme couture for a couple of years. I think that was the first time when he told me, enjoy this time, Michael, this is the least busy you'll ever be. I'm like, come on, dude, what are you talking about? Man, I feel busy right now, which I really wasn't, wasn't even close to as busy as I am right now. I feel like I got hundred pounds of crap in a brown paper bag right now. But back then, all I had to do was fight, pay my mortgage. I bought a house in Vegas, pay my mortgage, lived with my brother, lived with Mark Ellis, lived with two dudes that were just awesome dudes and we hung out and then all of a sudden got married, one of my dreams. Then the workload starts to, the responsibility load starts to increase, bought a house in San Diego, which was five times the house of my, or five times the price of the house in Vegas. So the mortgage got more expensive. Then he got the electric bills and all those other things that are more expensive in California. We had three dogs. And then I started to get into business and started doing other things aside from fighting. Then all of a sudden Hap comes along. Then all of a sudden Ace comes along, we moved to Nashville, Tennessee, that this house is couple times more than the house that I had back then. And I say that only because the mortgages get more expensive. The responsibilities get more expensive. The heartbeats around you increase. It was just me, just my heartbeat. Then it was me and Bree. Then it was me, Bree and the, or well, me and Bree and the three dogs. Now it's me and Bree and the two kids and a dog. And it's just the amount of responsibility I have right now. Chris Patterson said, enjoy this time. This is the least busy that you will ever be. So Shay and everybody listening right now, enjoy this time. If you are young, 
enjoy this time because the least this is the least busy that you will ever be. This is the least amount of responsibility that you will probably ever have in your entire life. And I don't say that because I want you to go party and live it up and YOLO, as the kids say these days. Enjoy the lack of responsibility, the lack of financial burden, the lack of workload burden, but still pursue passions, pursue the best version of yourself and start young. Shay, great question. Um, enjoy this moment because this is the least busy that you'll ever be. Next one comes from Jonah. Hello, Mr. Chandler. I'm a recent follower of MMA, but I have trained martial arts throughout my life. As a Christian, I am so encouraged by you and guys like you who are willing to represent your, your faith and live as a godly man, a godly husband, and a godly father. How do you navigate the lifestyle and demands that fame has brought, especially with a family? Also, what is your favorite Bible verse? Thank you for doing the podcast. It is very encouraging to slow down and hear a solid advice from a man who is working through life to the honor of to the honor of God. I am always encouraged to find resources that I can recommend um, to guys. Keep fighting the good fight. Sincerely, Jonah. Well, thank you, Jonah. Um, so the question is, how do you navigate life? the lifestyle and demand that fame has brought, especially with the family. And then also what is my favorite Bible verse? Um, Jonah, number one, thank you for the kind words. Um, trying to live life as a godly man, as a good man, as a, as a man who um, is striving for success, but also just trying to be a good father, a good husband, a good friend, good business owner, good fighter, good this, good that, good everything. Falling short, often, you know, or feeling like I'm falling short. Sometimes that's my own perception. I have way too high of a standard in a lot of different areas, which is something I need to work on probably. Um, but navigating the lifestyle and demand that fame has brought with a family, it's always just been the same for me. As I said earlier, um, more and more things get added to your plate, more and more platform gets added to your plate more and more followers and clicks and likes and views and all those things, which is just awesome. It's a, you know, it's a, I don't do it for that necessarily, but I'm not going to lie and say it doesn't, doesn't feel good to know that there are more and more people viewing more and more people listening. This podcast is taking off more and more downloads, more and more questions coming in, um, more and more speaking opportunities, more and more events that I get to do. Um, which brings about more and more success or the, the feeling or the, the illusion of success, if, if you will. So as far as navigating the lifestyle and the man, um, once again, going back to Tim Grover, who spoke this weekend at Operation Black Site, we talked about balance. And again, to give you more context, he was Michael Jordan's coach. He was Kobe Bryant's coach. A lot of very high functioning, high level, some of the greatest of all time athletes. He talked about balance and he actually called me out <laughs> in the middle of the, as he was talking about balance, which y'all got to hear Tim Grover speak, look him up, listen to his YouTube videos. If he's speaking anywhere within a thousand miles of you, go, go listen to him speak. His ability to captivate people and interact his, his talk was an hour long and it was fully interactive, making people stand up, pointing to people, make, calling them out, saying, making them say things, different things. Called me out two or three different times, pointing to me and saying, hey, Michael, when you're training for a fight, how much balance do you have? And my answer was very little, <laughs> you know, because when you're pursuing a certain thing, you're never going to feel like everything is in balance and that's okay the illusion of perfect balance or the striving for perfect balance can sometimes sometimes put so much pressure on you that you're going to be underperforming in every single area of your life. And I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to me. This is something that I deal with often. I could be the best father today, but I feel like I wasn't the best athlete. I could be the best athlete today, but I feel like I'm not the best father or husband because life is a series of trade-offs. Life is always a series of trade-offs trade-offs. If you are fully pursuing one thing as a byproduct, the other areas of your life 
are going to be taking a back seat in that moment. And that's not always a negative thing. For me, I know what I have to do as a man, and it's really being revealed to me a lot right now in this season. I know I have to do certain things to keep me at my best. I feel best when I'm doing this. I feel best when I'm doing the next thing, or I feel best when I'm engaging in this activity, or I'm working out this much, or I'm on a public platform doing events or being around people this much, or if I'm just hiding from social media, going dark, lay, laying low, being with my wife, taking her on dates this much. All of the different aspects and areas of my life that I'm juggling, they can't all be in perfect, perfect balance. So giving up this idea of perfect balance really is a freeing thing. And I say that because the question is, how do you navigate the lifestyle and the demand of, of the fame that, that the, of the fame that, that it has brought, especially with the family? And there's times that I know, and me and my wife are in agreement on this, and me and me and my wife talk about this often both in her life, her career, she's a career woman. She has to be selfish in order to be selfless. I have to be selfish in order to be selfless. I need to be selfish with my time to go make sure I go work out, make sure I go pursue the passion that God has put on my heart to be at these different events, to be on stages, to be speaking, to be connecting with people, to be on this platform that God has given me. I need to go do those things, which seems so selfish because it's what I want to do. And it seems like I'm neglecting the family because I do it so much, but I have to go be selfish in order to come home, open that door, walk through that threshold and be selfless to be the man that my wife deserves, to be the father that my kids deserve. To be the man that I want to be, I know I need to go fill up those different buckets. So for me, it's actually, it's a balancing act. As I said, there is no perfect balance, but there is always a balancing act. But the lifestyle and demand that fame has brought me, and it's never really been that hard for me. I don't even know anybody who is on, you know, listening right now who does have a certain amount of platform or quote unquote fame. I've never looked at myself as famous. It actually makes me feel really uncomfortable when someone's like, hey, dude, you're a famous, you're a celebrity. I'm like, no, dude, I don't think so. Uh, so it's never really been hard for me because I always just looked at myself as Michael. I've always just looked at myself as this, this guy. And I think I'm just, I've always been so nervous. I mean, not nervous, anxious, apprehensive, whatever the word might be, maybe afraid of, fearful of, ever coming off like, what people think a stereotypical famous person talks like, acts like, treats people like, what an average celebrity talks like, acts like, treats people like. I can tell you this though, and it just happened to me two days ago, actually. Got a number in my cell phone that I never would have thought would be in my cell phone. I mean, we're talking A-list celebrity, like A-list, A-list celebrity. Um, and I've got, you know, numerous of those in my phone. And I, and I don't say that to impress you. It sounds like I'm bragging, but it's like, I say that, I don't say that to impress you. I say that to impress upon you. The funny thing is we're all just human beings. And for every person of fame out there who's like, Hey man, that guy's kind of a jerk. That guy's kind of a jerk. The way he acts, the way he treats people, the way his nose is in the air, the way he carries himself. Yeah. He's got a lot of money and a ton of fame, but dude, nobody wants to be around him because he's just like that for every single person. For every person out there like that, I believe there's a couple, like some of the people that I've met where I'm like, dude, you are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. You are A-list type celebrity. You are the guy that everybody would want to be in a room with. You are the guy who could treat people like absolute dirt because you are, quote unquote, what the world would say is A-list celebrity, got everything, got the world by the cojones type of fame and fortune and accolades and platform, yet you treat people so well. You treat people like they're human beings. You treat people not like they are fans and sheep and followers and little peons and peasants down there 
looking up at you, you treat them as if you're looking right at them and you are both human beings. I'm like that is absolutely amazing. So I say that because A, I don't feel like I'm on that level whatsoever. I B, I always have tried to be the guy that when someone leaves an interaction with me, because I mean, I have had those moments where people are like, holy cow, I actually just had it this past weekend where somebody actually was genuinely jumping around excited, like, holy cow, I can't believe I'm meeting you, dude, Michael Chandler. You know, it was like, and it was freaking awesome for me. Maybe made me feel a little uncomfortable because of my, you know, get a little nervous when that kind of stuff happens. I'm like, hey, dude, I ain't that cool. Trust me. But even those type of people, me spending five minutes with them, talking to them, asking them questions, not just answering their questions and like making them feel like they're an actual human being. And I truly appreciate them. I always want those kinds of interactions where people leave those kind of interactions and say, man, that guy's pretty darn cool. He was so much cooler than I thought he was. Because no, no offense to me and all those people you look up to, we ain't nothing if we aren't kind and serving and loving to our, com our, co our common man, to the, to the everyday average human being. So as far as navigating it, that's been my mentality, making sure I almost overemphasizing that I'm not a celebrity or famous person. And then uh, going into the next question, what is my favorite Bible verse? Ooh, there's so many of them. Um, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against these shall prosper. I love that one. Um, you guys have heard me talk about James 1, 5. He who lacks wisdom, ask for it. And the Lord, your God, who gives it abundantly, will give it. Anytime you are going through a season of unclarity, fogginess, James 1, 5 says, just ask for wisdom. Don't ask for the answer. Don't ask for, don't ask for how this bad thing is going to turn into a good thing. Don't ask how this closed door is going to turn into an open door. Don't ask how, how the outcome is going to be. Just say, God, just give me some wisdom. Just give me wisdom here. Um, so Isaiah 54, 17, James 1, 5, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication and through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to god once again it ends with let your request be known to god when you're feeling anxious about something i know it says it right there be anxious for nothing it's like yeah right god or whoever wrote that philippians i think it was paul who wrote it yeah right paul be anxious for nothing right sounds so easy but when you unpack it that way be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to God. And I believe right after that, um, verse seven and eight, that's when, um, that's when it goes into, um, and the desires of your heart, uh, will be given to you essentially. Um, so Philippians 50 or no Philippians four, six was that James one, five Isaiah 54, 17. Um, yeah, that's it. So thank you, Jonah. Um, and thank you for thinking that uh, I have fame because I'm not sure that I do, but I will continue to strive. So you guys keep telling people about the podcast and uh, keep tuning in and uh, that quote unquote fame will keep getting bigger and bigger. And more than anything, it's just a platform and an ability to reach as many people as I possibly can. But thank you for the kind words. Next one. From James. Hello, Michael. I'm a huge fan from Nebraska. This week has been a mentally challenging one. I tried out for my baseball team and barely missed out. And mind you, baseball is the only sport that I play, so I was heartbroken. I feel I've let myself and my family down. I'm currently confused in what my next step should be. I used to be big in jujitsu, and maybe I'd try that path again. Any words of advice that you think could help me? Yeah. Words of advice? is daggum. We all fall, sh we all fall short. We all fail. We've all had these types of times in our life, James from Nebraska, that we were trying out for some proverbial baseball team, some metaphoric baseball team, and we didn't get it. Or to make matters even worse, we barely missed out. Can't tell you how many times, <laughs> can't tell you how many times. And over the last couple of years, people bring up that Oliveira fight. 
fighting for the world title, the number one spot in the entire world, my number one goal that I've always had since I started fighting. And I was so close to knocking the dude out. So close that if you go back and watch it, there was a time where the referee actually started lunging in like he was almost about to stop the fight. And I think I hit Oliveira again and then he moved just enough for him to pull back. You want to talk about barely missing out, James. You know, that's me barely missing out on my goal that I've had since I was 22 years old. 15 years, essentially 14 years, thir- I guess it was 13 years at that point. So I don't say that to to downplay what you're going through. I'm just saying, obviously, I know what what you mean, and uh, and every time someone brings it up, I'm kind of like, yeah, man, it was actually a cool experience, and you know, it worked out the way it worked out, and I can't do anything about it. But part of me is like, dang, dude, why you got to bring that up? That actually might affect me more than it than I think it does because I was so darn close. Um, I don't have context here, James, whether or not you are in middle school and you didn't make your traveling team, or if you're in high school and you didn't make your high school baseball team or shoot, if you're a pro and you didn't make the team, you know, but the fact that you say tried out sounds to me like you're probably in high school. Um, so I'll answer it in that way. Only thing you can do if that chapter is closed and the tryouts are over, there's no way you can be a reserve person for that team or a, uh, um, alternate for that team. Only thing you can do is get better. What can you do today that will ensure that the next time you get the opportunity to try out, that your your chances of making the team have increased? Maybe it's getting faster. Maybe it's getting stronger. Maybe it's being in the batting cages. Maybe it's working your fielding. Maybe it's throwing that baseball up against a a wall or a fence 10,000 times and catching ground balls, fielding balls. Maybe you're a pitcher. Throwing as many pitches. I I wouldn't, I almost said throw a thousand pitches. I know pitchers have to be very methodical about how many times they actually throw the ball as hard as they possibly can for injuries and elbows and shoulders and all that kind of stuff. But you get what I'm saying. Hate to say it, James, but you could probably do more. Once again, going back to what Tim Grover Talked about this past weekend, and I, and I keep bringing up Tim Grover because I, well, number one, he was awesome, completely exceeded my expectations as a speaker, and then got to meet him and talk to him. And now we're, you know, connected via text and might do some work with him. But he was talking about training Kobe. It was either Kobe or Michael Jordan. I mean, shoot, either up, either one of them, two of the greatest of all time. And he said how after they would get done with the game, If Jordan missed a shot or Kobe missed a shot, a certain shot from a certain area under a certain amount of, of pressure, if you will, they'd go, they'd go to the the gym after that, that night and hit that shot hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So James, not to be discouraging, but we can all do more, but James, I guarantee you can do more guarantee. You can do more today to do better with the skill set that you're lacking in. Maybe you're a great fielder, but you're not a great hitter. Maybe you're a great hitter, but you're not a great fielder. And I'm answering this question to anybody out there who maybe not a baseball player, maybe you're not an athlete, but whatever it is you need to get better at, you can get better at it. You can get better at it. We all have 24 hours in a day and we hear people say that all the time and it sounds cliche, but goodness gracious, the greatest baseball players of all time compared to the worst baseball player who can't even chew sunflower seeds and walk at the same time, they all had 24 hours in a day. Every single one of us listening right now, and even myself, once again, I'm talking to myself because I make excuses for this, these things all the time. We all have 24 hours in a day. The people that I look up to the most people that I admire, the people that I aspire to be like and be by and be with have what they have, do what they do, be who they are in so many different arenas of life, they all have 24 hours in a day just like I do. It's what you do with the 24 hours that determines how you go from point A to point B or you don't. So you say you're confused at what your next step should be. 
if you really are passionate about baseball and you say that you are heartbroken, you wrote it right there, that you are heartbroken, it doesn't sound like you need to just go ahead and pack it in and go start jujitsu. If you were heartbroken that you missed out, barely missed out on not making the team, go collect a crew and acquire the skills needed physically, mentally, and spiritually in order to make sure that 365 days from that day, they, they said, no, you weren't good enough, James, which we've all heard that, but it's a cruel world out there. We've all been said, we've all been there where it says, hey, you're not good enough. Me in front of 20,000 people at the Toyota Center in Houston, Texas, and in front of millions of people around the world, Oliveira got his hand raised, and that said, Michael, you weren't good enough. We've all been in those scenarios. You got 365 days since the day that that tryout ended to create the skills necessary to make that team next year. No, go do jujitsu ju recreationally, lift weights, do other sports, be athletic, become a better athlete in a lot of different ways, hire a strength coach, or make sure you're not skipping lifts. Make sure you're becoming a better athlete. As we said, you didn't give me context on how old you are, what grade you're in, where you're at, but I assume you might be in high school. High school, your body is growing. Your body is, you're turning into um, an actual athlete. You're turning into a more coordinated human being. So accrue those skills, become bigger, faster, stronger, happier, healthier, harder to kill. Start reading books, continue to listen to this podcast, listen to other podcasts that inspire you and uh, don't give up on that dream. I don't know why I'm saying that, James. I'm just saying don't give up on that dream. I think it's the heartbroken part right here that I'm looking at on this question that is telling me don't give up. And to every single person out there listening right now who would use the word heartbroken after they failed at something, don't give up. Really don't give up. So James, I hope that helps you. Next time you send in a question, you better tell me how much you've been getting after it. Lifting weights, in the batting cages, fielding balls, throwing balls, working on your mindset reading the book as a man thinketh listening to this podcast listening to a bunch of podcasts out there that are going to get you in the right spot thank you james next one from george hope all is well mike hope all is well you've been so gracious with your time to me in the past and i and i'm appreciative I played pro football in some developmental leagues not the nfl i'd call it the pfl slash bellator equivalent I did get a second job that allowed me to train and provide income for myself. That job has now turned into a COO and eventual CEO role and has taken control of my life. I feel as if I'll get another football opportunity, but I'm now stressed about making the decision between the job and football. I can't figure out if I should take all my lessons and grit from football and apply it to the corporate America or if God's way of testing me is to stay disciplined in my football pursuit. Very vague but it's been stressing me out and it's hard to find anyone who can understand. Man, George, um, this one's tough because in the last one, we were talking to James um, and we answered the question, assuming that he was in high school. George has been playing pro football in developmental leagues, not the NFL. Um, and now he's got a job that has allowed him to train and also provide an income for himself. That job is, is turned into a COO, which those of you that don't know, that would be most likely chief operating officer and an eventual CEO, chief executive officer role, and has taken control of his life. He feels as if he would get another football opportunity, but is now stressed about making that decision between the job and the football. And man, this one's, this one is tough. Because in the last one, I answered the question to um, James as if he was a high schooler and just needed to keep on keeping on and make the high school team. This one is a little bit tougher because I am never the type of person who would ever say, give up on your dreams. I'm never, it's a hard question to answer. It's so much easier when I get the questions like, hey man, 
I got this job as a programmer, computer programmer, but I really want to go and start my own job. When do I make that leap from going from being an employee to having my own business and then having employees and being an employer? Whereas this one, George says he's been playing pro football in developmental leagues, which obviously does not pay the bills. Um, and now he's got a job as the CEO, COO of a company that sounds like it could turn into, hopefully turn would turn into a CEO role, which, you know, he didn't talk about, George has not stated how much money he is making, nor does money buy happiness. Therefore, does that money even matter? It's really about what makes you truly happy. Um, but the second job has allowed him to train and provide an income for himself. But then it turned into the COO job that is pretty much taking control of his life. This is a tough crossroads that I think a lot of people find themselves in. A lot of athletes find themselves in. We never want to hear that we're not good enough. Even if we do hear that we're not good enough, we want to say, okay, well, I can keep training. I can keep getting after it. I can keep working. But in this scenario, when he's been in, been played been playing pro football in the developmental leagues, which means he's not in the NFL where there is any kind of money. Now, one thing is <clears throat> the crazy thing is now there's the XFL um, that has now come out over the last couple months. And if there's one person I would bet on that, that that league is going to be successful, it would definitely be the rock, you know, two people that I would always bet on Dana white and the rock when it comes to business, every single thing that they put their hand to turns to gold. It seems like, um, but you know, the funny thing is, speaking of The Rock, well, first of all, why did I bring up The Rock? Because now there's the opportunity to make money in the XFL. Maybe that's a possibility, George. Um, maybe you need to hear that right now. I don't know. But also I bring up The Rock because The Rock was at this position as well. We know The Rock's story of Seven Bucks Productions is his production company. Why is it called Seven Bucks? Because he says he has he had seven bucks in his pocket. He had seven bucks to his name when he gave up when he gave up football, went into pro wrestling, and obviously going into pro wrestling still probably had seven bucks because he will probably wasn't making any money there. So I think if you would go back to you know the Rock, the Rock probably would have said, "Shoot, man, I would would have killed for a COO and an eventual CEO role that would probably be making a lot of money." Um, but it's so hard for, for me to say, George, whether or not you should quote unquote, give up on the football dream and, and go into the corporate world and take those, take those uh, lessons and grit from football that you've had and apply them to the corporate America. I would say one in the hand is better than two in the bush. Sometimes the fact that you've been in the, de 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 the developmental league and not in the NFL or haven't been getting looks from other NFL teams, or maybe those things are on the table. If those things are on the table at all, if you have an agent, if you have good, if you have good um, relationships with your agent and maybe even some of the college coaches who are going to end, end up being eventual head coaches in the next year or so, or becoming a strength coach at a certain team where you can really kind of get an in. I do think as much as the NFL is a business, it's not always not always what you know, it's who you know. It's not always how good you are, it's who knows you. Um, it's not always how good you are, it's how good your reputation is. Um, so this one's hard for me to answer. But the good thing is, like you said, you can't figure out if you, you should take all your lessons in grit from football and apply them to corporate America or if it's just God's way of testing you to stay disciplined in your football pursuit. Number one, as we talked about, a, a question or two ago about my favorite Bible verse, James 1, 5, he who lacks wisdom, ask for it and the Lord your God will give it to you. Ask for wisdom. Every single day, ask for wisdom. Continue to stay training. Continue to stay in shape. Um, but, you know, being the COO or even the CEO takes over your life, but also maybe gives you a little bit of opportunity here and there that if you ever did get some sort of tryout, some sort of, some sort of look, some sort of opportunity to go play in front of people or work out in front of people, get a tryout. Um, those would be the, kind of the, the building blocks that I would say that maybe you should pursue. But unless you're, if you're not getting those things, giving up on a great job that is 
making you good money in corporate America to just, you know, stay in shape and and train for football if there really isn't any leads out there, that's where you really got to ask. Pray for wisdom every single day. Get better every single day, not just in football, but also in corporate America. But if you're not getting those looks, have if you don't have those relationships, if those phone calls aren't coming in or you don't have somebody on your on your behalf making phone calls to to break that barrier and get into the NFL or as I mentioned earlier, the XFL, which I know is not paying great, but at least it's playing football. At least it's televised. So that's a hard one, George. And yes, as you said, it is very vague, but I know it's been stressing you out. But all I can say is never grow weary in, in doing right. Never stop asking for wisdom. Every single one of you guys listening, that would be my that would be my encouragement to all of you guys and my 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 demand for you guys. Doesn't hurt to ask for wisdom, to ask for clarity, to ask for help, to ask for to ask for the tools, the people to come into your life, the right hands to shake the right place at the right time happens only to those who diligently seek the best versions of themselves and diligently seek to get outside of their comfort zone and take chances. So George, I hope it all works out. I hope you feel peace with, with, with whatever you do decide and everybody else keep pursuing your passions. Keep trying to win the battle between your ears Stay patient, as Mark Wahlberg says, stay prayed up, asking for wisdom, asking for clarity, asking for help. Don't try to force doors open that aren't ready to be opened or that never will open. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers, as the great Garth Brooks said. Life is tough. Decisions are tough to make. Seasons can be tough, but sometimes the toughest seasons are the springboard, the coiling of the spring that springs you into the greatest moments of your life. And I believe that for every single one of you guys, I believe that your best days and blessed days are out ahead of you. And I thank you all for sending in these questions. If you enjoyed the content, if you enjoyed the show, the podcast, make sure you send in more questions to podcast at michaelchandler.com. We will... uh Keep on doing these and keep on bringing you guys value. Make sure you share it with people. Subscribe, like, do all those things that they tell you to do um, and share it with people. If you got value out of this or you know somebody who would be getting value out of this, we can't keep on changing the world for the better unless these things are shared with the right people. Um, So I appreciate you guys. Have a wonderful day. God bless. And I'll see you at the top. 